Welcome everyone. Hello, my name is Jonathan Cullen um, and it's great that so many of you have been able to join um, online for the Alumni Festival and to hear um, my talk this morning. Uh, the talk's entitled, What Really Makes a Difference? The Role of Resource Efficiency in Mitigating Climate Change. And this is essentially the research that I do. We'll, we'll be with you for an hour. Um, so I'm gonna talk for around 35, 40 minutes um, and then there'll be some questions at the end. Just a little bit about myself. I, I run the Resource Efficiency Collective at Cambridge um, group. We range about 10 people generally. Uh, so a, a quite an, a small group and a new group looking at these issues of resource efficiency. And I wanna start the talk with this idea of what really makes a difference. Um, I arrived in Cambridge uh, 15 years ago. Um, I grew up in New Zealand. Uh, a long way from here, the best country in the world and, and also the best country to be in at the moment in the world, I think, with our COVID issues. Um, and then I went to Lima and spent uh, five years in Lima, Peru, working uh, in various uh, charitable kind of projects, including trying to do biodiesel in the jungle and, and lots of fun things. And I, I ended up coming here to Cambridge. And on the first day of my PhD, um, I'd, I'd organized to do a PhD on taking the ink off paper. So we all know that paper's recycled, but it uses quite a lot of energy to, to wet it and mush it up. Um, and we were trying to work out if we could laser the ink off the paper and remove it to ablate it. Um, but I arrived on the first day of my PhD and my supervisor, um, Professor Julian Allwood, uh, said to me, sorry, but I've changed your topic. Um, I want you to answer a question that's been bugging me over the summer, which is what really makes a difference? And of course I said, uh, a difference to what? Um, and he said, well, you know, everyone's talking about sustainability and climate change, and we're all working on lots of really exciting solutions and possible ways forward, but which, what's really gonna make a difference? What, when people say, what should we do? What do I tell them? And that's what I've spent the last 15 years trying to answer, is, is the scanning the options, the solutions, the, the smart technologies, the ways we could change our behavior, and, and saying, which of these options is going to scale up and make a difference and be able to get us towards the climate change targets, um, which we've set into law as net, zero by 2050. I want to start with this picture. Um, this is the London Underground and Train System, or a, a snapshot of that. Well, actually, it isn't the London Underground and Train System. It's, it's actually a picture of, a representation of the London Underground and Train System. And we, we call this, um, as kind of engineers, a complex system, or a system of systems. You imagine uh, any system is, is a kind of a set of parts which when combined have qualities that are, are over and above the individual qualities of those parts. So when you bring those quality, these parts together, you get emergent properties of the system. Um, a train by itself is not very useful, but a train put into an underground system becomes very useful for a lot of people. Um, so, in this diagram, we've got the system of systems. So we, we've got things like the trains, the drivers, passengers, oyster card payments, lights, heatings, toilets, security, signage. All of these are systems in their own right, and together they create what we would call a, a system of systems. And in this particular example, the, the underground system, let's take, every movement is tracked. People are tracked, trains are tracked, drivers are tracked, security is tracked, there are cameras everywhere watching to make sure the system goes well. If we just got on a, a train at Ealing Common, Common and, and no one knew what was happening until we arrived at Oxford Circus, um, that wouldn't be a good train system. There'd be all sorts of security issues. Uh, we would have chaos if we weren't tracking all the things in this system. But when it comes to uh, how we, we live in society, and I'm talking really about our electricity system, our energy system, and 
uh, also an, an industrial system that makes all the goods and brings them to us, we're not actually very good at tracking what happens. We know what happens in individual companies. We know that one steel company is making some steel and passing it on to the next company that manufactures it into a car, and then it's sold to a dealer, and then it goes to a consumer. But we don't actually trace these materials. We trace money, but we don't trace the energy and the materials as they flow through the system. Um, and yet these systems, you know, of, of energy systems and industrial systems, the transport system, they provide the goods and services that we desire, but they also create the emissions and the environmental impact at the other end. And so by not knowing how materials and energy are flowing through society, we don't really know what would make a big difference. We don't know what we could change in the system to still deliver what we want with less impact. And that really, in a nutshell, is resource efficiency. Can we deliver future energy and material services, the things that you and I want, while reducing the re resource use, the energy and material inputs, and the environmental impact of those? Can we make this system more efficient? And how do we know where to act? What would really make a difference? Where can we change things? So that's how I set out in the PhD. And the first diagram I drew um, was a map of global energy. So I went as big as you can go to see what would make a difference. Um, this traces energy on, on the left-hand side from oil, biomass, gas, coal, etc. The little red dots are the carbon emissions um, back in 2005, sorry, it's a while back now. Um, and we're tracing that right through the types of devices, the electricity system down the bottom, the, the types of engines and burners and devices that convert energy, you know, oil, into something that's actually useful for us to use. The blue there is, is, is motion or kinetic energy, vehicles moving, the red is heat, and the black is some other things. And then tracing through the industrial system, because a lot of our um, electric motors and heat are used to make materials, and onto these final services, which is actually the things we want. We want to go from one place to another. We want to eat, we want hygiene, we want to be warm and comfortable, we want to communicate. And, and immediately we can start to see, based on this diagram, what might make a difference. Um, in, in the column called conversion devices, if we were to eliminate all aircraft and all lighting devices at the top and the bottom, it would make very li little difference to the amount of energy we use in the world. And therefore, not much difference to our emissions. And, and this is a problem. We find ourselves focusing very often on the wrong things, the things that don't really make a difference. And that's what we set out to try and achieve. We've done this. This is a map of uh, global steel flows. Um, here, what makes a difference? Well, you can see these light gray uh, flows that come around the bottom. They are the scrap flows from industry, but it's the wrong kind of scrap. Um, scrap when, when we've used a product and discarded it, we want to recycle that product. So an old car gets crushed up, we recycle it. But these, this is a different type of scrap. This is the bits of steel that are cut off from our steel products as we're making them. It's the window that gets cut out of the, the door on a car. The piece of steel that gets cut out gets recycled around. And that's the wrong type of recycling because that piece of steel hasn't even been used. And it turns out a quarter of all steel never makes it into a product. And half of all aluminium made never makes it into a product. Instead, we cycle it back round to remelt it again. We can also see some other things. In the steel diagram, the biggest thing we can do, re reinforcing bar, you might not be able to see it on your screen. I, I don't know, I'll point, I don't know if that's working, but it's a flow in the green near the bottom. That's the biggest steel product we make. And if we just made all reinforcing bar in the world at the same strength that we made it at, in the UK, so across the whole world we use the same strength, we would save the most carbon emissions of any one thing to do. A huge amount of carbon emissions would be saved. Um, here's another interesting diagram. This one is online and it's actually interactive. This is now taking the energy diagram I showed 
and adding the emissions. So on the right-hand side, we've swapped sides. On the right-hand side, we've got the emissions of CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and some fluorine gases. And we're tracing that through the system all the way back to these services they provide on the left-hand side. Now, this is slightly different as well because we've included the food at the bottom because there's a lot of emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from food. And it turns out when you add it up, food is the biggest chunk of our emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions down the bottom. Oh, apologies. I, I think that's back to normal. Food's the biggest chunk. And so doing something about food, food because it releases a lot of methane and CO2 emissions when we make the food, but it also includes lots of transport, lots of nitrogen fertilizers to make from the energy system. So we can start to see that food might be something that we might focus on. Um, this diagram's nice, and I'm not gonna show it to you online, but I'm gonna show you some screenshots because if I click on industry, it blows that industry up into the five or six different main industries. And if we do the same thing again, we can, we can drill down into the, the specific categories. This makes the diagram a bit hard to understand, but if, you, if you're interested in, for, for instance, how much emissions come from cement, you can go and find that out. These diagrams aren't new. They, um, first, Sankey diagrams is what they're called, these flow diagrams, and the first one uh, was used by an Irish captain called Matthew Sankey in 1898, and I've reproduced it here for you. Um, it, it's a, a two pictures of a steam engine, and even uh, someone who doesn't understand anything about steam engines can quickly see that the, the output on the right-hand side of both these engines is the same, but the bottom engine has much smaller flows of steam, so is more efficient. It's more efficient in, in converting the coal into the steam. And so these diagrams are, are nice to be able to spot efficiency. Uh, see, Sankey diagrams were used um, again heavily actually during World War II by the Germans when they were running short of resources um, because maybe the English were doing a good job of taking out some of their dams and things. Um, so they started tracking all their uh, steel, coal, uh, iron ore, tracking them across Germany using these uh, Sankey diagrams. But when I came to do my PhD, no one was using Sankey diagrams. So that, that's one of the things. I discovered a nice visualization, um, which has done me well. It's, it's got me a, a lectureship at Cambridge and um, set me on a great path for research. So when we were looking at these diagrams, what makes a difference? One of the things we found was that um, about a third of our emissions come from using buildings, a third of them come from using vehicles, and a third of them come from making these buildings, vehicles, and other things, the industry part. And we have good options um, for improving buildings. We know how to make a building, a passive house building that doesn't require any heating, so we insulate it and seal it well enough. So it requires no heating. Um, and that's the, the big part of our, our buildings. We know how to make electric vehicles that could be linked up with renewable energy that essentially become carbon free. We've got good options there. They're not cheap, but we, we could push that way. But when it comes to industry, what we found is industry um, was much more challenging to deal with. And so what makes a difference is to focus for us on industry and trying to sort out um, this whole sector that makes the goods that we use. The problem with industry, and I'm using steel as an example, um, steel and cement make up about 20% of our emissions, which is more than all passenger vehicles, and yet no one will ever really tell you that. Um, looking at steel, we've got massive growth of steel. So over the, the last 50 years, fourfold increase in steel, um, it's expected to double by 2050, and that's driven by economies that are developing, that are becoming wealthier. At the same time, and this is a graph of, of energy efficiency of the steel industry, uh, we've become better and better. We've halved the amount of energy in both the processes of uh, steel from iron ore and steel from recycled scrap. We've halved the amount of energy that we need 
um, to make that a tonne of steel, and we're getting close to the limit. So we can't do much about energy efficiency. So the challenge here is um, if we want to halve emissions, say, I mean, we want, we want to do much more than half emissions, but if we wanted to halve emissions by 2050, we would need, um, and, and we're doubling the amount of steel that we're making, we, we would need to cut the emissions um, in steel per tonne by 75%. And that is incredibly challenged, given we are, are very close to the technical limits of the efficiency on steel. Um, this was the subject of a book we wrote. So this is Professor Julian Allwood, myself, six PhD students. We wrote this book called Sustainable Materials with both eyes open. It's available for free download from the link there. Uh, it also, if you buy it from Amazon, it now has a new cover and a slightly different title. Um, that's what uh, publishers do, is change the titles um, after you've written them, but that's fine. Uh, so if you were to buy a, a copy, that's what you would get. Um, what the book said, we, we looked at this problem of industry. How, what could we do? And we said first, okay, let's look at all the things that are currently on the table, all the energy efficiency options, the novel processes that the industry is already looking at. And we did a, a full modeling of, of them. As I said, we can't get very far with energy efficiency, maybe 10 to 20% more gain. All the novel processes, we modeled them. They're very difficult, they're very expensive, and they largely require replacing every steel plant in the world. Um, and no one knows who will pay for like, replacing those steel plants. We could recycle. We already recycled 80% for steel, so we could bump that up maybe to 90%, but we can't do much more there. And we could employ low carbon energy, and we, we modeled that. The problem is that the low carbon energy is, is already needed. The renewables are already needed for our cars and our houses and our heat pumps and these technologies going on board. And, and the question is, can we build enough renewables to also cover industry? And when we model that, if we were to do everything we thought were possible perfectly in the world, involving every plant in the world, we felt we, we modeled you could get around half, 50% reduction per tonne of steel. But if we're doubling the demand for steel over the next 50 years, that equals no savings in carbon. And that is frightening when we're signing up net zero targets. Um, we, we felt we couldn't get there. So what else could we do? Well, essentially we, we went back and talked to our grandmothers and said, what would they have done? Um, well, that's a joke. Essentially we could design better and, and across a number of case studies, we can reduce by 30% the amount of steel in, in products by designing better. We could reduce the losses in, in manufacturing that 25% quarter of all steel that never makes it into a product. And we could divert scrap to other uses. And there's a nice example at the top right here is um, bits of steel cut out of car windows being used for the backing plates on your light switches. Great example of diverting scrap. We could reuse uh, steel with no melting, and it turns out all beams that are in buildings can be reused unless there's a fire. So we could take the, the steel beams out of buildings and put them back into new buildings. We could make uh, products last longer, um, which spreads the impact over its time. So make buildings last longer, make cars last longer. And we could reduce final demand, so we could share things. Um, in Cambridge, I currently have three offices, one at home, one in my college, and one in the department, and I tend to work in cafes. So um, there's a kind of a waste of space going on. And, and, and yet when I try to give my office back to someone else, I'm not allowed to. So there are some things in the way we do where we don't actually use our products and our steel very well. If we did all of those things, and all the one eye open things together, we could maybe get to three quarters emission reduction per tonne, with doubling of steel in the future, that means 50% reduction. So we could do a lot of work and we might get close to some of the targets. Our new targets are 100% reductions in absolute emissions. So we're going to be struggling, but we need to take on board some of these demand side material efficiency options. And Bill Gates, just to say, picked this up in 2012 and, and included it on his top um, six book of the year list. 
Um, so it, it's had quite a lot of traction uh, in, in Europe and also in the, U, U, um, in the US around um, this idea of material efficiency. So moving on, the nice thing we like about this process, since that time, this is, we wrote the book back 2012, so since that time, we've done lots more work in this space. And the nice thing about this, this approach, this um, approach to looking at the whole system is it scales. We can look at the whole global system, we can come down to country systems, we can look at the steel sector, we can look at a company, we can go right down to a process you know, a specific thing we're doing. And so it's quite nice and um, we're getting this line of sight. So I'm going to introduce you to a case study of a PhD student, um, Anna, who worked on this idea of resource efficiency in industry. The idea was to take our resource maps from Cambridge and link it up with the control data, which is all of the computer data that's used in industry to control a factory and see if we can create resource diagrams for that factory. Great project sponsored by um, Emerson, which is a US company. Here's just a kind of a schematic of what we're trying to do. Um, what was novel about this is we're trying to map both the energy and materials going into an industry, and then the products, and also the waste and byproducts coming out. So we're trying to get an efficiency of how good are we at converting energy materials into the product that we want and what kind of waste do we have. And here's an example of just, it gets complicated because there's many processes that you need to join up. And um, Anna did some work uh, looking at global steel plants, so 38 steel plants in the world across three different production routes and brought that all in together into a global map. Um, I won't go through the detail, but this has been very useful for understanding where the big flows are. Um, I'll give you one example is there's, a, there's something called flares there. It's a purple flow around the middle. That's gas, waste gas from plants, which has just burnt and flared to the air in a chimney stack. Um, and it's a huge amount. It's, it's, it, you know, it, it's a lot of uh, gas energy that we could be using in a power plant. And about half of that gas is taken into a power plant, converted to electricity, the other half in the world is currently just flared and wasted. That's a really easy game that we could do something about. I'm gonna play you just a quick video of that work, um, which I'm gonna share my screen. Apparently in the chat, I think you will have a, a link there if you need it. I'm, uh, I'm just gonna to have to share across to get into QuickTime and play the video. So sit back and look at it. This is a kind of a, a marketing um, video around this technique we've developed with Emerson. Today, industries are responsible for a quarter of global CO2 emissions and about 40% of global final energy use. Improving resource efficiency, that is producing the same output from less resource inputs, is indispensable to remain competitive while reducing emissions. But despite being under increasing pressure to quantify their resource efficiency, plant managers still struggle to provide a meaningful metric. That's because industry production involves a myriad of processes. Combined, it constitutes a complex network of interacting resources. Capturing these interactions is difficult because companies measure energy efficiency and material efficiency using separate indicators, only gaining partial insight into the potential of resource efficiency. So how can companies adequately measure their resource efficiency? Together with the University of Cambridge, Emerson's Operational Certainty Consultancy team has developed an engineering solution based on established thermodynamic methods. Adding a new performance metric is taxing. That's why we don't just offer another metric. Our indicator is unique in that it integrates energy and material flows into a single dimensionless measure. We understand that not all resources are equally valuable, so we measure the quality as well as the quantity of resources. By doing so, we track both profitability and environmental stewardship and unparalleled capability. We trace resource flows across entire systems and account for their composition, temperature and pressure, and not just their mass. 
This helps us judge what streams are worth focusing on. At Emerson, we want to empower manufacturers to make the right choices at the right time. To do so over a wide portfolio of resource efficiency options and by capturing unavoidable trade-offs with our resource efficiency metric, it is now possible for companies to skillfully manage their resources efficiently from bottom up. During daily operations and through strategic sector benchmarks. For more information, contact us at www.emerson.com forward slash op certainty. Great. Um, I'm, I'm just going to reshare my screen now again. Back to the slides. I hope you could see that. If you can't, I think there is a, um, a, a version going to be put up on um, online. I hope you can see the screen again. We're back to normal. So that was fun. That was, that was taking research and actually getting it into a product and getting it out there. Um, so we had a lot of fun with that and making the video was fun as well. Um, I want to share just a second case study, just the last thing I want to share with you, which is um, around petrochemicals and chemicals. And it's a space that we're, we're doing a lot of work in. This is uh, a, another PhD student, Peter, uh, was sponsored uh, by the BP. He's now working with the International Energy Agency. And we wanted to map petrochemicals and chemicals. And this is by far the hardest sector to map because unlike steel, which is basically one product, petrochemicals and chemicals is hundreds of products. And, and each process needs to be, be balanced using um, the chemistry, molar reactions going on. So it's quite, quite complicated. What we wanted to do is, is understand of the, the fossil fuel energy going into the system, what type of products are we making? And I'm talking about plastic products, I'm talking about fibers for, for textiles, and I'm also talking about fertilizers as well, which is a, a, a big, nitrogen fertilizers is a big part of the, the chemical system. The problem we have, um, this is graphs from the International Energy Agency, is, is again, these chemicals and plastics are growing at fast rates. So it, even with climate change, we're expected to still keep producing lots. This is a graph of thermoplastics, roughly doubling by 2050. Um, and, and that's because they're very useful. Uh, we use a lot of them um, and, and they are useful for us. So when it came to mapping it, it was, it was about a year and a half's work, um, 200 reference sites, balancing um, all the equations across hundreds of different chemicals and products. Uh, we produced this graph. Um, again, I won't go into the detail. There's a lot in there. Um, and this has been quite revolutionary for the industry. No one before had really mapped out right across this whole sector. No one had an understanding. So, so companies have an understanding about the, the ethylene they make, but no one really understood where that ethylene went, how much went into polyethylene, where did those, those plastics end up, what types of uses were they in. And you can see, you know, on the left-hand side, we, the most of our, the, the source material for petrochemicals and chemicals comes from oil, that's the light grey. Natural gas is quite big, um, particularly with the kind of fracking industry going on in the US, there's a, it's a big growth market. Coal in China is important for petrochemicals as well, quite carbon emitting. On the right hand side, you can see that this is in, these are in tons. That nitrogen fertilizers are huge. Thermoplastics are big. And then we've got some other categories around thermosets, fibers, and solvents. And, and just to give you an example about how this makes a difference, if we think about the, the nitrogen flow, that's the blue flow at the top. Um, we could spend a lot of effort trying to make ammonia production more efficient and we might make it 10% more efficient, say, by investing huge amounts in every plant in the world to make it more efficient. But currently, when we put nitrogen fertilizers on the ground, only half of the nitrogen ends up in the plant. And so there's a potential to, to double the efficiency of application of nitrogen. And there's some very clever people working on that in Cambridge, trying to work out how to modify plants to absorb nitrogen. It turns out clover does, absorbs nitrogen from the air. Um, we just need to try and work out how to make wheat uh, absorb nitrogen. 
And that would be a major breakthrough and probably make, in reality, more of a difference than changing the efficiency of ammonia production. What we can do with these types of maps, um, so you, you'll see here the map is in the kind of center bottom, um, but it, the map provides the link. And this is what's crucial. If we don't understand how materials and energy flow, we can't make the connection. So this map provides the link between the primary energy and the emissions going on in refineries. The, the primary energy in the power sector going in to make these products and the emissions going on. But also, you know, how much use phase emissions, you know, some of these processes, uh, nitrogen releases, um, greenhouse gas emissions while it's, you know, sitting up there. So we, we, we can understand what the emissions are from the use phase. We can understand what the emissions are from uh, end of life treatment. So incineration, recycling, uh, landfill, what are, the, what are the impacts of these activities? We can link those in. We can understand how people use these durable products, how long they use them for, what, how long do they take. Um, it turns out we, you know, about half of our plastics that we actually can touch that are in things is in construction. And yet we never hear about construction plastic, we only hear about single-use consumable plastic. So we can start to look at some things that might make a difference in construction, for instance. And fertilizer, we can address these issues of low yields of fertilizer application to plants, recycling, etc. So then we can look across the whole system, this complex system of systems, and identify what levers we've got to improve it, what levers we've got to bring the emissions down. And that's, that is what we're trying to do. Understand right across large systems, where technologies, where behavior change, where efforts will make a difference. Um, an example for plastics, the UK uh, has, is banning plastic straws. It's an easy win, but it makes almost no difference to plastic production. It's less than 0.1% of our plastic production or consumption that we use in the UK. So if we're putting a lot of effort into doing that, and if we're putting in a lot of effort into creating alternative straws made of paper, which are plastic coated as well, just warning you, um, then maybe that's not the right thing to focus all our policy attention on. Maybe we need to look at construction waste, for instance. Just putting it out there. Finally, just to say, we've, we've just released yesterday, um, or soft launched, a report um, as part of a, a project called Surplus here at Cambridge, a number of academics looking at plastics. It's called the P word, plastics in the UK, practical and pervasive but problematic. And it addresses some of these issues um, of how plastics are going. And, and I've, I've put the link up there. You're welcome to download that, have a look. It's, it's very user friendly. We've, we've got a designer in to, to make it really nice. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is we're starting a new project um, on Monday, next Monday, which is called See-Through Carbon Clarity in the Global Petrochemical Supply Chain. Uh, this is a 4 million US um, project across uh, the states, the two research groups in the states and Cambridge and Bath. Uh, so quite a big project looking at these issues of the petrochemical sector and, and taking our global map and disaggregating it down to different regions and different places um, trying to understand what we can do. And the, the key here is, is plastics is so many different materials. We need so many different solutions. One solution is not going to work for every plastic. So that's the key. And finally, I just want to leave you with a graphic which comes out of this, this P-Red report that um, you're welcome to download because uh, it's pretty and I like pretty diagrams. Um, UK plastic flows. So this is from production on the left hand side in, in the middle and imports. We import a lot more plastic than we make. Um, tracing through all the different plastic types through different stages of you know, raw plastic pellets, making them into products and then into their final applications. And you can see packaging is 2.2 million tons consumed out of 6.4 total, so about a third. Um, We've got construction, we've got consumer products, we've got textiles, we've got agriculture, automotive. 
we can start to unpick what strategies are required for different plastics in different products um, with these types of diagrams. And there's plenty more of these in the report if you're interested in trying to, to look at them and you'll also be able to zoom in and see a bit more of the detail. So thank you. Uh, that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed uh, this, this overview of this research that we're doing, um, which I would class as, you know, trying to answer the question, what makes a difference for climate change? But the tools we are using is to map energy and material flows as they go through society and try and understand where we can intervene. And if we intervene, what effect that has on the emissions this idea of where we can tinker, where we can change levers. And, you know, just from my point of view, we need every lever we can possibly do. We need to use less plastic. We need to make it more efficiently. We need to decarbonize it with renewable energies and CCS or whatever. We need to try and do everything because the challenge of reaching net zero uh, carbon emissions in 2050 is huge and quite scary. So that's just my encouragement. If we've got as many options on the table, that's the best way to go. Question and answers. So um, I've just, we just tried to summarize some of these, um, these questions. So question one, um, this is coming from Jen Hayes. At the point where something is manufactured, shouldn't it be coded, including color coding, so as to make it precisely clear how should be, it should be disposed or recycled. Objects should be so designed and manufactured as to facilitate their own disposal. Absolutely, great point. Um, we've, we've spent a hundred years working out how to make things very cleverly, you know, from cars to iPhones to computers um, and, and to assemble them. And, and part of that assembly and making them durable means gluing them together and screwing them and welding them. Um, but we need to rethink how we make things. We need to, to rethink, we take for example buildings, um, every steel beam in a building is bolted and yet when it comes to demolishing a building, all we do is knock it down um, with a big wrecking ball. So we need to think about truly um, designing well for you know, recovery at the end of life. I think in plastics, that's really important because we've got so many different plastics. I mean, there are about eight main categories, but we've got hundreds within that. And, and you can't recycle those plastics together. At the moment, PET type of plastic that you get in your, your soft drink bottle is very easy to recycle. Um, we recycle that at about 70% rate in the UK. Plastic films that cover your, your meat or vegetables, um, incredibly important because they reduce emissions from food waste, but are not recycled in the UK because they're very difficult. They're low volume, they're dirty, and they're made up of lots of layers. So there's, there's a whole problem here where when we're designing uh, new products, we, we typically design them for quality and low cost, but we need to add environmental performance and, and, and our kind of circularity of that product. Can we bring that background? And I think the answer there is actually something called producer responsibility. That is saying the companies that make these products need to know how to take them back. And if they have to take them back, then it's their problem to be able to disassemble it. And suddenly you'll find the designs change. Um, okay, that's probably a too long. Um, Question two, how do you persuade industry not to design built-in obsolescence? Same issue. I think um, an answer here is, is leasing, actually. Um, if we were to, if, I'm, if I was to lease my car, then it's up to the car company who's making that car to make sure it doesn't break down and suddenly they'll make it more efficient. But even better than leasing would be to have it as a service where I don't even pay for the petrol or I have heating in my home and I don't pay for the gas. I just am guaranteed a home at 20 degrees. It's someone else's problem there, whether they use gas or a heat pump or whether they come in and insulate my house um, because I'm just paying for the service. That drives the right, right connections there. 
this is hard answering questions without actually talking to you. So I'm, I, I apologize. It feels very one way. I hope I, I can't see you. I can't get your reaction. So I apologize for that. Healthcare consumes a large portion of GDP. Where do you think the focus should be to make a difference? End users, supply chains, manufacturing and production or other areas. Ah, health, healthcare. Um, so one of my colleagues, Professor John Clarkson, has done a lot of work on um, healthcare products and, and also buildings in healthcare. And, you know, the building stock of our hospitals and, and our schools at the moment, um, which are a large chunk of buildings, uh, an incredibly poor state. They're, they're so far from what I described as this passive house where you don't need to heat them because they're well insulated and well designed. Um, we're building very cheap buildings and a lot of them are very old, uh, prefabricated buildings that don't even have proper insulation. And so the, the energy bill and the, the, the emissions associated with just the buildings in the NHS are huge. Um, then you take single-use plastic, a uh, massive issue. Um, we can't reuse because of the contamination issues. What do you do um, if we burn them, which is what we currently do them, that, that's, that's good to get rid of the, the viruses and clean them up, creates carbon emissions. 2050, we won't have that option to burn them. So, you, you know, the UK doesn't have space to landfill them. Um, is a problem. I mean, the stats in the UK is roughly a third of our plastic waste is landfilled, a third is incinerated, and a third is recycled. But when we look at that recycling, despite all our efforts, um, uh, you know, that, that third, um, a third of the third is only recycled in the UK. Only 10% of the plastic is recycled in the UK. The other 20%, the other two thirds of that third, is sent overseas. And we can't guarantee that it's recycled overseas. Even though we call it recycling, we can't even guarantee it's recycled. Um, so big problem, health, yes, very important. Sorry, I was saying the questions from Jen Hayes, but actually that's, <laughs> that's the person sending me the questions. Apologies as well. I don't know who your questions are from, sorry. Okay, another question. How do you see the outlook for plastic production from artificial photosynthesis or other processes using direct air captured CO2. Um, okay, direct air capture. Uh, so as a, as a technology to pull carbon out of the air, direct air capture is um, very expensive currently. Um, it also, to make it carbon kind of neutral, you've got to use renewable energy and you've got to use a lot of renewable energy. Um, so there's a question around have we got enough renewable energy and do we really want to be spending uh, valuable re renewable energy on direct air capture? Uh, the reason is it's just simple thermodynamics. If you study physics is you need a lot more energy to undo the combustion reaction to take CO2 back to carbon. Um, I, I think Maybe doing it with plants is better because that's a natural process. It, it, we, we don't need to provide the renewable energy. The sun does that. Plants are quite low efficiency at, at capture, so there's, a, there's an issue there. And there's a problem of growing things. But if we could use secondary uh, plant biomass, so the stalks from uh, you know, the chaff from the wheat, if you like, and if we could work out, and that's what lots of people are trying to do, is work out how to break that back down um, into, you know, carbon that could then make a plastic. Um, so we, we're doing a, I'm do, involved in a project that we're bidding for called Supplant um, with James Elliott and Paul Dupre, and, and that's the idea of that plant, is can we make uh, that, that project, can we make a product with the properties of plastic, so a bag with the properties of plastic, it, you know, resistant to water, very strong, uh, lightweight, but is essentially made from, from wood or waste crops. So it's essentially paper. Can we make a paper bag that has the properties of plastic? And, and that's a big challenge. We, our current paper bags, firstly, they're not very strong and also they're coated in plastic to try and make the moisture not get into them. That causes microfiber issues. So there's a big issue there. Going from plastic to bags to paper bags, I don't think is particularly wise. 
um, I've put that out there. But if we could make a paper bag truly from paper type resources, wood, that had the properties of plastic, that would be great. Okay, uh, question, where are we up to? Five, just looking at the time. Should we be replacing older, less efficient cars? What's the trade-off between the use phase and manufacturing phases? You have to do the calculation every time. And, and that, that is a calculation we do in techniques like life cycle assessment, which where you look at this, this calculation. But we, we have, we published a paper recently, um, Matteo Craglia, who's one of our PhD students just left. And his paper um, asked this question. It said, of all the options you have for UK vehicles, and he, 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 he's got a model of every vehicle in the country, what's the best thing to do? And it, and it turns out, um, you know, through some sensitivity analysis that's quite clever, we can say that about 70% of the kind of the gain you get comes from switching to electric, even including the manufacturing cycles there. So, so going over to electric vehicles, in 2030, 2035 is a very good thing to do. And the reason why is we've done quite a good job of decarbonizing the UK electrical grid. We're almost not using any coal anymore. We've got renewables being built. We've got nuclear plants, which are getting old, but still going. So we've done a good job of decarbonizing our electricity. And so the best thing you can do is move over to electric. It costs a lot, but that's the best thing to do from an environmental point of view. The second best thing you can do is drive smaller cars. So don't get an SUV. And one of the problems in the UK at the moment is many of the electric vehicles coming on the market are the big SUVs because they can recover their money a little bit more, the car manufacturers. Um, okay, I think this might be the last question. So if you've got another burning question, you're welcome to answer. Uh, oh, this, oh, this is not really a question. It says, you've done an amazing job tracking carbon around the world. Are there any tools you recommend for organizations trying to understand the flow of carbon in their work? Working for infrastructure client in the UK, it's very hard to understand where we are using the most carbon. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, there is a lot of work going on um, uh, at the moment and, and we're, we're seeing the tie turn in construction. You know, people like myself and some of my colleagues, um, John Orr particularly, he's, he's been going on, Tim Ibel, uh, structural engineer people have, have been going on for 20 years about infrastructure embodied carbon that means the carbon we use to to make these products um, and, and it comes under a brand called whole life carbon and right now there are several groups the I struct e organization structural engineers organization um, several others that are looking at this problem of can we get better data can we say with more accuracy how much carbon is used to make a building? And, and why is this important? Well, 20, 30 years ago, you know, the fraction of carbon that went into make a building was about 10% of the total carbon used over its lifetime because they were leaky buildings using a lot of gas energy. And so most of what you could do was reducing the heating with gas. But we are doing quite a good job of reducing emissions in the use phase of buildings. Um, the new standards coming in, um, we are, we're looking to outlaw condensing gas boilers and go right over to heat pumps, which are much more efficient, insulating buildings better. We could go further, but we're doing a good job. And so currently buildings built today are about 50% carbon in the structure embodied and 50% over the lifetime of the use. And we're seeing that number increasing. So, so embodied carbon, the industry part, going back to the talk, this emissions from our industry is becoming a problem. We're doing a good job of decarbonizing cars, use of cars and use of buildings, but actually our industrial emissions are going up. So we need to make sure we address these carbon issues in buildings. Oh, there are lots more. <laughs> Sorry, I'm only getting a few. Sorry, we're not going to be able to answer all your questions, but we'll keep going. Um, okay, from someone, when is waste to energy the most efficient manner to deal with waste? Okay, I'm an academic, so I'm going to um, 
say you have to look at each situation. Um, in the plastic report we just released yesterday, we, you know, it, it's actually our opinion that um, the waste hierarchy, which we've had for 20, 25 years, which, which states you should recycle first, then recover with incineration, then landfill, is not actually driving uh, recycling. And it, it turns out those three options are being used about a third each, despite all the push towards recycling. And there's a good reason for that. It's because it's very, very difficult to recycle many of the products. As I said before, soft drink bottles, yes, absolutely recycle. Plastic film, what do we do with it? Waste, single-use plastic waste from uh, hospitals, what do we do with it? And the challenges here are each of the options have their problems. Recycling, it's not profitable. No one in the UK really wants to do it except for the very easy products. So we send a lot of it overseas and we can't guarantee it's actually recycled overseas. Only 10% of our plastics are actually recycled, despite training a whole country to separate their plastics out. We are only recycling 10% in the UK. Um, it's not working. Incineration is an option, um, it, but it releases CO2. So unless we can find a way to capture that CO2 or convert it into carbon directly, into solid carbon, um, we've still got a problem there because post 2050, we can't afford to be releasing any emissions at all. Landfill, we don't have much space in the UK, but, but if done well in, in certain countries, landfill is like putting the oil back in the ground. You've got to clean it, you've got to be careful uh, about leachates, um, but most plastics last a long time. And so maybe landfilling for a time when in the future, you know, sorting and landfilling when we might be able to get it back is, is an option for some plastics that we can't recycle. So I, 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 on our hierarchy, we've created a new hierarchy in this plastic. We've put them all equal and we've said, you've got to do the numbers. You've got to work out how much energy and extra carbon it's going to take to recycle. Some products take more carbon, more energy to recycle than to make them from scratch. And that seems crazy. That's making something circular and recycling, but creating a problem in carbon emissions. Um, so options. Okay, time, I've got four minutes. That, so that was from some, from Joe. With materiality being one of the key points here, where in the supply chain we get the biggest bang for the buck of reducing emissions, what steps are being taken to engage government to help them play a better role in educating incentives consumers to make the right choices? Your point on plastic straws not moving the needs, driving builders, homeowners to choose aluminium windows, which can be recycled easily, rather than PVC, which I believe are ultimately much less efficient. Okay, I'll, I'll take the first part of that question. Um, I need to be careful here because, you know, there are a lot of good people trying to do a good, lot of good work in this space. And we've got good colleagues in, in DEFRA and, and, and trying to work on these issues. But in my view, focusing on straws, stirrers and um, cotton buds is a mistake. You know, it's taken two or three years to push through. And it's just too small. We're just not using enough of them. Um, and the, the alternatives are not necessarily there. We all use wood stirrers, but they don't get composted. They, they get thrown in the rubbish into the landfill. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's the right um, strategy. Uh, we also focus a lot on carrier bags and we've done a great job of reducing the number of carrier bags. But uh, from everything we're seeing, we're not using any less plastic in carrier bags for supermarkets because the new bags are much heavier and many people are still using them only once or twice. So, uh, you know, the humble plastic carrier bag is the most efficient carrying device we've ever made. It carries a thousand times its weight. Um, if we were to reuse those humble plastic carrier bags, like many of the kind of environmentalists have been doing for a long time, they are probably still the best solution using one of those bags 10 times. Um, I'm not going to get into uh, aluminium versus wood versus PVC windows. 
Um, there is a lot out there comparing those options and they all have their own uh, failings and, and good points. Um, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to be drawn on that question. Two minutes, can carbon labeling help companies and consumers identify changes and that make a difference? Yes and no. Car carbon labeling of a product is very difficult. Um, in our work, we scale up to the whole nation size, which means we can capture all of the problems and all of the emissions. Once you look at just one product, it's very hard to say what the boundary is um, of what you include. Ta let's take, for example, um, a teaspoon. Do I include the steel? Yes, probably. The electricity to make this, the teaspoon? Yes. Do I include the trip, um, the commute of the factory uh, manager from home to the, to the factory every day that makes the spoons? Maybe. Do I include the lunch that the factory manager that she had 20 years earlier when she was studying at Cambridge University? I don't know, but what happens if studying at Cambridge University in that lunch meant she passed her exam, which meant she got the job in the factory? So the causality becomes incredibly difficult when you look at one product. And that's the reason why carbon labeling of food has failed, essentially, is no one can agree what the boundary is to keep include things. So we scale up because you, it's much easier to set a boundary around the country. I am out of time. Um, I, I could have answered lots more and I hope you uh, appreciated this um, talk. Um, I'm gonna just put my slide back up because I think there is a thank you slide on here. No, that one, oh, no, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm just going to say thank you very much. Um, it's been great talking to you. I, um, it's been hard talking one way. I would love to have been in a lecture theatre with you. If you want to contact me or my group and ask questions, you're welcome to. Please download the plastic report and have a look at it. I think you'll enjoy it if you're a person who's interested in what we might do about plastic. Um, and, and hopefully I've helped, well, maybe not helped, but helped give you some tools for thinking about what would make a difference. Thank you.